Hi, this is Miranda Wright, and this is day 40 of our 120-day Upper Room prayer campaign. And 40 is the number of promise. Today we're going to pray for faith to embrace the weight for the promise. In previous podcasts, we've talked about seeking the Lord, hearing that word for Him that we might stand in faith on it. We've talked about different seasons and the reasons for those seasons and that there often comes a time of waiting. Because you see, when we take the time to seek the Lord, He will give us a word, a promise, a destination. And we become so excited with anticipation, thinking that it will be an immediate thing. And so then often many times when we don't see exactly what we are expecting, we lose faith and fall away. This was the error of the Israelites in the wilderness is that they expected to march out of Egypt and right into promise. But they did not understand that there was a season, there was a reason for the season, that there was a wilderness that they had to go through in between. It was a season, there was a reason for the season, there was a stripping away, because though the Israelites had been taken out of Egypt, Egypt had not been taken out of the Israelites, and so if they had gone into promise, they would have taken Egypt with them into promise. My friend, God has given you a promise, but just because he's given you the destination doesn't mean that you're ready to take it. There are some things that have to be cut away, stripped away. There are some dependencies that have to die in the wilderness. And if we are not willing to let them go, but to cling to them, then we will either go back to Egypt or we will die with them. But God does not want it to be so. So my friend, I'm here today to give you this warning and encouragement so that you might see it and recognize what the Lord is doing so that you might see it, understand it, recognize and believe in the majesty of the perfection of God's plan in exactly how he will cause you to enter in to that promised land. Because my friend, he will give you that promise. That seed will be planted deep in your heart. You will have excited anticipation for it. And then, my friend, the thing that you're not expecting, the revelation and realization that the promise must die. Because you see, every promise in God's word comes with a condition of faith. But what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For if we can see it, then there is no faith. That is to say, if we can see how it can be done or achieved, then our faith will be in the how and not in the who. Therefore, does God always allow every promise that he gives to die? so that we might truly plant our faith in him to resurrect it. We might say that we have faith, but until the promise has died, we will never actually have the opportunity to use and to prove faith, that God and God alone might be accredited and glorified for all that it does. We see this throughout all of scripture. We see it in Joseph, who was promised as a child that his family would bow to him. Yet as soon as he received the promise, it died as his own family sold him into slavery and he was imprisoned in a foreign land. Yet not until the promise was fully dead with no hope of being achieved by any earthly means did God step in and resurrect it through divine means that all of history would know that God alone had done this. We see it in the story of the Tishbite woman, who God had promised and given a child. Then the child of promise died. But you see, this was the moment that she was able to administer true faith as she held her lifeless promise in her arms and spoke those powerful words that have echoed through the ages. It is well. She stood in faith that God had promised this. Therefore, would he resurrect it to see his promise fulfilled unto his glory and faithfulness. We see it in Abraham and Sarah who were promised a child with legacy, yet was the womb of promise dead. Therefore, was the condition for true faith met that they might be able to believe in something that they could see no way of achieving but by the power of God. We see it in David who was promised the kingship of Israel, then was cast out of the palace and pursued with the cruel hand of death as Saul sought mercilessly to kill him. We see it in Jairus who sought healing from the Lord, yet as soon as he found him, he received word that his daughter had died. 
We see it in Lazarus, who walked and talked with the promise and was called friend by him. Yet when he needed him the most, it seemed he was so far away as he died and was laid in darkness for a season. Yet in all these was not the end of the promise, but the beginning of the opportunity for faith to be placed in it. If it can be done by natural means, then is it dead to faith? But when it becomes dead to any natural means, does it become alive to faith? In other words, the supernatural cannot truly prove itself possible until the natural has first proven itself impossible. Therefore, it is when all natural hope is lost that faith can finally take the stage. My friend, sometimes he has to clear the stage before he can set it. So when God gives you a promise and it straightway seems to die, do not be dismayed. For the promise must die before it can truly live. It must die to any hope of being accomplished by human means in order to prove that it was accomplished by God's means. After all, do we not see this in Jesus himself? The greatest promise that God has ever given had to die. That his power, glory, and kingship never be attributed to any natural means because of all that we might think of our own power. We know that only God can raise that which is dead to newness of life. Therefore, he had to let the promise die and then resurrect it so that all would forever know that this promise wasn't achieved by any natural how, but by a supernatural who. You see, a faith that lies in how is a faith in knowledge, which was man's original sin. But a faith that lies in who is a faith in God, which is man's redemption. Therefore, does God always first have to kill the how before he will glorify the who? And to do this, the promise must die. In John chapter 12, verse 23, we read, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. In other words, Passover has to come before Pentecost. It's the only way. It's God's way. My friend, faith is a seed. It starts out small and then grows and grows until it reaches out and starts providing life, strength, hope, deliverance, and power to others around it as faith stirs faith. However, no seed of faith will ever grow until it first dies. So when your promise seems lost, cast away, and buried, this is when you need to apply faith and wait for things to change because when you least expect it, God sends the rain to totally change that seed and bring that dead thing to life. I am telling you, when you stand in faith on God's words in the face of the impossible and God resurrects that dead promise, oh, how your faith begins to grow. So if God has given you the faith of a tiny mustard seed, don't let it stay a tiny dead seed. Plant that thing deep in your heart. And when it starts to die, praise God all the more for the awesome resurrected promise and growing faith that is going to come from it and the fruit it will produce to bless not only you, but all those around you, if you but only believe. Jesus tells us very clearly in Mark chapter 4 verse 30, he says, Wherefore unto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it was sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all the herbs and shooteth out great branches so that all the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. You see, my friend, we've all heard about that mustard seed of faith, that if you have but the faith of a mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain and say, be thou removed to yonder place. And if you believe it will be cast out, but we've been misled because we're told that it's about a tiny faith that can do big things. That's not the message of the mustard seed. Jesus said the the mustard seed is a seed that starts out small, but if you allow it to grow and grow and grow, it can become the greatest of all herbs. It's not about a tiny faith that does big things. It's about a faith that grows. Because you see, my friend, there's no power in the dead seed. But when you plant that seed and you let it die, and then by the watering of the Holy Spirit, his grace comes to bring it back to life. 
Because the Bible says that the word brings death, but the spirit brings life. When you get alone and you abide and you reside by that river, it will begin to grow and you will become that tree that is planted by the waters whose roots go down deep and draw from the waters of that deep well spring and reach out into the air and that faith begins to grow and branch out when you've spent that time by the brook Cherith, letting the Holy Spirit do its work, feed you, nourish you, cut away what needs to be cut away. Sanctification, consecration, dedication. A bride who abides with a faith that started out tiny, but it grows and becomes the largest of all herbs so that it becomes protection and shelter and nourishment and provision for all of those around it. My friend, I am here to encourage you today because many have sold you a false faith, a faith that says, come and claim the name and he'll give you fame and material gain and everything's gonna happen immediately. My friend, it's a lie straight from the pit of hell meant to cause you to lose faith when the promise dies. But I'm here today to help you realize that until it dies, it cannot be resurrected into newness of life and you will never see the greater things of the kingdom of God unless you stand in faith and dig your roots into the river of God and abide and draw from the flowing of that river and let it move through you and let it nourish you and let it strengthen you and let it grow in you because it's something he's going to do with you. He's going to do through you. You will become the tree that is planted by the water. When the seed of the word of the living God has been planted in you and it has grown up in you, it will branch out. It will reach out. It will help others. It will protect. It will shelter. It will produce fruit, which will then contain their own seed, a word from the Lord to be planted in the heart of another person who then needs to know that they need to go and be planted by the river. They need to know that they have to die before they can be resurrected to newness of life. And they've got to stand in faith. They've got to be willing to take the season of dying, of hiding, of growing, and then of going as they began to produce fruit and spread forth what the Lord had always intended to do. Don't settle for that tiny seed of dead faith. Plant it and believe and let it grow. It's not about a tiny faith that does big things. It's about a faith that grows to do the greater things. Oh God, we want that faith faith. God, I thank you that you are willing to plan it, to speak it, if we will grab hold of it and believe it, because we don't want to put our faith anymore in the how. We want to put our faith in the who, in you, in what only you can do. We're going to stop trying to figure it out. We're going to go and get by that river and let our roots go down deep, 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 because the deep calleth unto the deep. Because the word says that that tree, it won't even budge whenever the drought comes. Her leaves won't fall. She won't be weary or withered. She will stand firm in the word of God because she has learned how to draw from the river. She won't be confused or confounded. God, we need a people that won't be pushed around, that won't be shaken by every wind of doctrine. But we need trees that are planted near the water with strong roots because that they have stood in faith through the test of time and they have not looked for another way or compromised. No more counterfeits, no more weak, brittle, shallow rooted trees that are blown over by every storm. But God, raise up some mighty oaks because you see, See, my friend, there are trees and my dad always preached that there are two kinds of people. There are pine trees and there are oak trees because you see the pine tree, it grows up really fast. It reaches for the sky. It wants to be seen, but its roots are very shallow. There is more invested in what is seen than what is not seen. And so that when the first wind or trial or storm comes, it is easily knocked over and uprooted. But then there are the oak trees. They grow so slow. 
but their roots go down deep and they spread out so that what is actually there in the unseen is far greater and larger and more powerful than what is there in the seen. The tree that we see on the top is not nearly as big as the root system that is under the ground. And a true man or woman of God works more in the unseen. They spend more time in that place of prayer, in that place of worship, in that place of communion with God than they do in the pulpit or on the stage or on the street. Yes, there is a part that is seen, but it does not compare to what is in the unseen. And it is in the unseen that it is reaching down to draw up those deep wells of living water that it can nourish people and bear fruit in the scene. God make us oak trees. Though it's not quick or easy, it's slow growing, it's slow going, but we will dig our roots down deep and believe. Because you see, my friend, we all understand here in the South that even the strongest hurricane can't budge that mighty oak. Forget little winds of doctrines, trials and tribulations and the little storms of this life. God, we give you thanks for this revelation and for this word, and I pray that you plant it in the heart of the people, that when that time comes, when the enemy rushes in like a flood and tries to tell them that there is no hope, that they need to give up, that in that moment they will remember the word, that the promise must die, but that just means that you're getting ready to bring it back to life by miraculous means. Because you see, there was a time, my friend, When Jesus was trying to explain to his disciples that he would have to leave them, that he would have to be crucified. And Peter spoke up and he said, oh no, Lord, not you. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, get ye behind me, Satan. Your heart is set on earthly things. Mine is set on eternal things. Because you see, in Peter's heart, he thought, oh, I'm serving a great rabbi. He does all these great signs and wonders and miracles. We're going to have a big ministry. We're going to overthrow our local occupiers. The enemy that so directly affects us. We're going to deal with that. And we're going to have a great and mighty ministry. He was looking at physical things. The things of the earth right here and now. And he was ready to obtain it by easy means. And Jesus said, no, that's the devil speaking in your ear. Because Jesus had rebuked the same temptation in the wilderness. It was nothing but the devil. Because there is no other means. But to go through Gethsemane. The promise must die. Because God's not concerned with our little temporary kingdoms and what we think we can build right here to make things easy. He's worried about his eternal kingdom and what will bring the most souls into it. All Peter could see was his little local sphere of influence and that he wanted to see the oppressor over his city overthrown. But Jesus could see the big picture that by going through Gethsemane and doing what only God could do, he was going to destroy the kingdoms of hell. We see the seed and we don't want to let it go. God sees the tree and says, now it's time to sow. God, help us to see what you see and to be what you want us to be. But to do it, we've got to allow some things to die. And not least among them, our pride. Because it's not going to happen the way that we think it's going to happen. Because you've got a bigger plan. You're fighting a bigger battle. And if we will trust you, we will see a bigger victory. My friend, have faith when the promise dies that he is still able to cause it to rise. You've got to have the faith of faithful Abraham who was willing to lay the child of promise down because that he was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to accomplish. Just know that sometimes he's got to clear the stage before he can set it. So have faith and wait by the water, and I promise you won't regret it.